Hi everyone. Um, as Katie said, my name is Catherine. I am a fellow this summer, so I'm working on my graduate research out here. Um, so I'm going to tell you about that, but before I start with that, I want to do a little introduction on how I came to be here. Um, so way back in the day, I started off on the East Coast where I was born, and I lived in Maryland, and I play in the sand and go to the beach. I can, you know, had a lot of marine influence. Okay. Um, I, I had a lot of marine influence at an early stage of my life, so I didn't really know that I would be doing this, but um, there was some subtle influence along the way. Um, and then I ended up moving from Maryland to California, um, Northern California, where my family currently lives, and the best part of my family are my two dogs. <laughs> During my the rest of my childhood and into my early college years, I was an avid horseback rider, so I was pretty convinced that this is what I was going to be doing and that I'd be going to the Olympics for this. Uh, so I worked really hard at this, and then I realized I need to get a real job. Um, <laughs> so I was going to, um, to school originally for photography and film, uh, which again, I was passionate about it, and um, I wanted to do you know all such types of nickname. Uh, nature nature photography, sorry. And so I wanted to work for National Geographic, which led me to get my open water certification because I felt like that would be, you know, a good asset to have and I could work on terrestrial projects and marine projects. Little did I know that I started to get away from photography and film and I really wanted science. Um, and then at my community college, I took a marine bio course and just fell in love with it. So that kind of started me onto this course. Um, and then I transferred down to Long Beach State to finish my undergrad. And I did a semester out here as a part of the CSU Catalina semester for a whole fall semester. Um, and I just had a crash course into the marine sciences, which was amazing. Um, and then from there, I decided I wanted to go to graduate school. So I started this past fall at Cal State Northridge um, bio program, and I got to work on all sorts of projects. Um, one of them was identifying and um, taking pictures and film of giant sea bass. This is a juvenile um, off the coast of San Clemente. And so a lab up at UC Santa Barbara is using this footage to identify them by their spot patterns that they have around their sides. Um, so juveniles and adults. Um, I've been able to work on my specific advisors project, which involves um, working with small little fish called gobies and um, looking at how they change, they are sex changing fish. So they can go from male to female, female to male, back and forth. Um, so they're looking at a couple different things that can influence that um, sex change. And I learned that I had a lot of fun um, amidst the stress of grad school. There's a lot of great people that I've been able to meet and am still meeting and currently having fun. Um, but that kind of led me up to this summer when I started my own research, um, which is I'm looking at the effects of an invasive alga, sargassum horneri, on the trophic dynamics of temperate rocky reefs. So I'm going to start off with a little bit of background on what an invasive species is. Um, it's defined as a non-native or alien species to the ecosystem that it is being considered. Uh, they, are, they have some sort of economic and or environmental harm. They also have human harm indirectly. And they're often in human mediated. So somehow they are being transported because humans are traveling. Um, so a few examples are the in English ivy, which is invasive um, to our mainly the East Coast, but all around here. Um, and this was back in the 1800s, and it can it can take over a whole area and outcompete native species, and it forms this dense habitat that critters can't live in either. So it's taking away from other plants and other animals. We have the European rabbit, which was famous for being brought over to Australia and has basically exploded in its population and has destroyed crops and just kind of taken over there. And then we have the zebra mussel, which is famous for uh, our country over in the Great Lakes. And these, um, as you can see, they get, they just kind of pile on top of 
each other on any type of structure, and they're capable of fouling up props like this um, or clogging intake pipes for different um, like generation like that. So marine evasions are specifically an issue, um, and we've seen a lot of them arising because there's been this great inc increase in the global transportation of um, goods. So if we look at this map, these red lines, all the white, and then the red lines <laughs> are even um, more highly traversed paths, you can see that these are all shipping tracks. So all around the world, we have the big ports like over in Asia, we have our own down here in LA, and, you know, all over, there's just so much shipping every day. So it's hard to, it's hard to not get any type of invasive species that can kind of hitch a ride around. But you can see that even though we are far from East Asia, there is still this connectedness that's happening through these uh, shipping paths. So, and how these invasive species come about is they're usually stuck in, they get taken up in the ballast water under here. So these big ships, when they don't have any cargo on top, they're too light so they could tip over. So what they do is they uptake water in whatever port they're at to kind of weigh down the boat and then it'll go to its destination. And when the cargo is put onto the boat, then it's heavy. So it offloads that water and then, then it can travel back. So it has that weight. But what they've done is they've taken up that water at one destination and then they bring it all the way across the ocean and then they offload it at another destination. So you can get these little invasive hitchhikers in there and uh, they can sometimes survive in these new habitats. And the most common of these invaders for marine are algae or seaweed. Um, I'll refer to seaweed as algae, but that's what I'm talking about. And unfortunately, a lot of studies have looked at some of these algal invasions, but not a lot of them have looked at the impacts that they're having on higher trophic levels. So you have the seaweed, the alga, and then you have some type of organism that's directly um, interacting with it. But what's happening to this other organism that's possibly eating that, that middle one? And what's happening with that interaction? So that's what I want to look at. So again, we start with, for example, um, fish. We have tons of fish around here off the coast of Catalina, like this rock grass. And then we have their food source, which are these tiny little um, animals called um, microinverts. So they're like little, little crabs or snails, anything like that. They're microscopic, so they're covering the algae, but um, if you were to shake it off, you'd find a ton of these guys under a microscope. And they're living on all the little, little blades and fronds of the algae. So the fish are uh, feeding on these microinverts, and the microinverts are alternatively feeding on the algae. So they, they're herbivores. They are eating. And then they, the algae is providing this food source. So we have this positive effect for the uh, microinverts. And then we have a positive effect for the fish because that's what they're eating. So these guys are all getting this energy resource. But what we don't know are these indirect interactions. So what is the algae actually having? What is the algae actually having on the fish? And what is the fish actually having on the fish? Oh. So my, my study species is the is sargassum horneri, the invasive alga. Uh, this is native to South Korea, Japan, and China. And again, this one was suspected to have been brought over by the ballast water of those container ships. It's an annual brown alga, which means it can complete its life cycle in one year. So within one year, you have it, um, it settles, it grows, it becomes an adult, it reproduces, and then it dies. And then the cycle starts all over again. So it makes it really good at being able to compete with other algae because it can grow really, really fast. And like other uh, brown algae, that is a part of the big group of brown algae, they possess these anti-herbivory chemical defenses in the form of phenolic compounds. So what the heck does all that mean? Uh, basically, they can excrete some type of chemical that makes those little microinverts or even some herbivorous fish, um, it kind of makes it taste gross, so impalatable. Um, so that way, it doesn't get eaten. So 
how this how this alga came about over here is it was first discovered in off the coast here or sorry in the Long Beach Harbor over here in 2003 and then it was discovered on Catalina Island in 2006 so just right around where we are here in two harbors and then as you see as the years go on three years later all the black dark dots are where they started to find it so this whole area is the Southern California Bight. You have the Northern Ch Channel Islands, LA, you have um, Catalina. And you can just see that very rapidly, it just starts to, it's everywhere. Um, so its dispersal rate has just uh, taken off since its first introduction here. So my big question is, what effects is this having on these higher trophic levels, or mainly the fish? So my study species, uh, or sorry, my study sites are on Catalina Island over here. This is where we are at the Wrigley Marine Institute. Um, and I have six species, or six sites, sorry. Uh, the first one is Arrow Point. I have Howland's Landing, Lion Head, Intakes, which is, which is just right out of the corner here, out of the cove, uh, Yellowtail Point, and Empire Landing. So at each of these sites, I'm conducting these foraging observations of three study species, which are sheephead, garibaldi, and rock grass. And during these observations, I'm going down and I'm scuba diving, and I find a fish, and I start to follow them. I give them a 30-second acclimation period to get used to my presence so I don't scare them away. Um, and then I start a five-minute foraging observation. So I'm following them around, I'm timing it, and I'm recording the number of bites they're taking and on what algal species they're taking it. So again, they're not specifically eating the algae itself, they're eating the little microinverts that are living on it, but I'm trying to record um, what, what is the most common food, um, the common habitat for their food. So what algal species is the most common that they're selecting. Um, and then I'm doing these benthic uh, surveys so I can essentially get an idea of, okay, this is my site. What, what's the percentage of these algal species um, that is present in these sites? So how much is available for these inverts and for the fish to interact with? Um, so when I do that, I, I run out these four transects at two different depths. So I'm doing at 15 feet and at 20 feet, and I run out 30 meter transects, and they're separated by 20 meters. But this basically gives me almost a 200 meter um, span of the site. So I can, I can ensure that the fish that I'm following are pretty much staying in that same general area. So that is their home, their home range, their habitat. Um, so I can get an idea of exactly what they're living among and what's there and available for them. And along each point, I'm doing something called the point contact method. So I just cruise along these transects and I look at different um, pre determine randomized points, saying what is right here and what alga species is that, um, which I will later analyze. Then I'm, um, I'm currently doing those uh, last two phases, so the observations and the benthic phase, and then I will be, uh, shortly I'll be starting my alga collection, so I'm going to be collecting the invasive species, sargassum horneri, our native one, sargassum pomeri, so it's related, uh, but this one has always been native here. Another one, Dictyopterus and Zenaria, which these are all pretty common. And if you go snorkeling around anywhere here, um, you're most likely seeing a lot of these. Big, these both grow in very, very big, bushy tufts. Um, so it's everywhere, and this is the, like prime habitat for these microinverts. I collect them in these micron mesh bags. So when I collect the algae, um, I essentially put it over the algae and I cinch the um, bag at the base so I can ensure that I get all the little microinverts that are living on it. Later on I can lab, uh, which I then go, I filter them through with fresh water um, through these sieves so that I can just collect the, um, the microinverts as opposed to some of the small little um, algal bits and things like that. I'm just getting the organisms and then I'm counting and identifying them. Um, so I'm trying to figure out what species, uh, which is pretty much impossible. So sometimes it's just like clam or snail, <laughs> very scientific. But um, I'm trying to get an idea of their diversity as well. 
Then I will also be starting um, some fish collections. So I have chosen just to collect rock grass uh, because they are very abundant and they, they, their primary food source are these um, little microinverts. They don't really get much bigger um, to where they can eat larger prey like sheephead can eat urchins or big, big things like that. These guys are primary, primarily eating those microinverts. So I'll be collecting rock grass, uh, 50 individuals at each site. And I'll be taking them back to the lab and extracting their otolus. So it's a part of their inner ear that you basically can look at. Um, it looks like a tree, the rings of a tree, and you can calculate their age and growth uh, based on those rings. And I want to see if there's any impact in sites with maybe higher densities of the invasive. Maybe they're not growing as much as other sites. Um, and then I will also be extracting their gonads see if they're same thing, sites that have more of this invasive, are they finding enough food to be able to reproduce um, as well as at other sites that have more of the native um, <clears throat> algae and worse. And then I will also be looking at their guts, um, which will be fun to identify, you know, what to, to make sure that they are um, eating some of these microinverts and then also to see if I can find, if I can identify any um, algal pieces that could be just a byproduct. So when they go to bite, maybe they get a chunk of algae with those little um, microinverts and see if maybe I can identify that they are foraging on uh, among that the invasive um, or not. So overall, what does all this mean? Um, we know that it has, that Sargassum horneri has rapidly become a dominant alga around our island and the whole Southern California bite. And so it's really important to understand these effects and what they're having at the, with these higher trophic levels so we can, um, you know, we can t uh, monitor them to see if there's anything going on immediately right now um, or for the future we could keep monitoring it and see if we see a shift in the fish populations and if there's a decline and something that we can do about that um, to kind of head off this, this impact. And results could, could provide some insight to the actual invasiveness of this alga. Um, and what I mean by that is potentially everyone has called, people will refer to this alga as the devil weed because it's just taken over. And, um, and you know, it has, and at this point we can't necessarily get rid of it, um, but either the study could show that it is having this negative impact and we need to put in some uh, mitigation uh, uh, policies to help the fish populations and other native algal species, or maybe this is just another alga that's here, but it's still providing some sort of a habitat for these um, little microinverts and the fish are still being able to find enough food. Um, so maybe it's not that bad of an invasive. Um, so I'm hoping that this will shed some light on it and um, we can kind of see exactly what's going on with our ecosystems which will help us further uh, be able to preserve the biodiversity that we have around this island. Amazing. That, I'd like to thank these people. Thank you guys for coming out here. Um, and I'll take any questions if you guys have any. I just have a statement. I've been mm -hmm. diving here since the 60s and just the last week snorkeling, I saw that, mm -hmm. but I had, didn't recognize it mm -hmm. and hadn't seen it before that I, you know, cognizantly looked at it and said, what is that? Right. There's, like you said, a lot of it. Oh, yeah. It's actually um, that the intake pipe site where that's um, just on the other side of the cove here, uh, facing Bird Rock, and that's where we have the big pipes that bring in all the... Um, that site, when I was doing my undergraduate, undergraduate um, here in fall of 2015, that was covered with Horner Eye. So in the fall, it's at its adult stage. So you'll see it and it's like, I mean, it could be as tall as me. Um, and that was just covered with it. There was no kelp because it was during El Nino, the kelp had died off. Uh, so it was just this huge mat of this horner eye everywhere. Now the kelp has come back over there and it's not as abundant at that site. But if you go to Lionhead, you'll see a bunch of, on the rocks, it just looks like this brown what's on it, you know, like turfy stuff. Um, it's all the little recruits of horner eye. So if you come back in the fall, you'll probably see that the adults over there. So it's pretty crazy exactly where it is, but 
Yeah, you see that. One of my thoughts was, is it taking over where the kelp can't hold fast because that's there? That's what I was wondering because I didn't see kelp, I just saw that. Right. So there's a lot of different studies being done right now to try to see about its like competitive um, nature with kelp. Uh, I'm not specifically looking at its association with kelp, but uh, there's a few things that come into <clears throat> play with the water temperature. Kelp really, really thrives in cold nutrient water. So again, we had that warm water event and it just it stressed it out and it died off. Um, kelp is also a perennial, so instead of um, having a, it's completing its life cycle every year, like a, um, like sargasm, it completes it every two years. So you could have this fluctuation of when it's dying off, and then you see the um, invasive come in, and it, and it can overcrowd or outcompete for space to attach, you know, all sorts of things like that. Um, some people are looking into chemical things, and so there's a lot being done. But yes, that's definitely like one of the um, one of the thoughts is that it can kind of overcrowd and, but as soon as kelp comes in, it can change. So, trade off. Um, yeah. I'm sorry, I have one more question. <laughs> yes. So that, the um, horn rye, mm -hmm. it, it, it exists okay in the warmer waters? Or how warm or? Yeah, um, I don't really know what its, ther what its thermal threshold is, so what's the upper limit of kelp. Um, there haven't, unfortunately, there haven't been much, um, there hasn't been much research on its actual, um, most of its physiology and everything out in the water uh, it range. They, there's a lot of uh, research done for it for antioxidants used in like medications and things. Uh, so that's a big factor. But um, it seems to do okay in the warmer water. It can be found from like 10 feet all the way down to about like 50, 60. So it's got a very, uh, very good rain pro, which makes it a good invasive. Kind of these generalists, and they can just take over. So, yeah, that would be something to be to look into. In terms of months, uh, what is its uh, life cycle? Um, so, it's more of, it's been classified by seasons, uh, but I've seen a little bit of, there's a lot of overlap. So, typically in summertime, um, Summer to end of summer fruiting, so it's like the juveniles have settled and it's starting to grow. And then in the fall, it's at its adult stage. And then in the winter, it's reproducing. And then in the spring uh, to summer, it starts to die. So yeah, so it, it kind of. But I've seen this overlap where I, you know, part of my research, I was like, okay, I'll look at, I'll test the um, chemical compounds that it, it's excreting at each life stage. And I thought I'd have to come out each season. When I came out at the beginning of the summer, I found some dying, I found some recruits, I found adults, and I found some with reproductive receptacles. So I was like, all right, it's all happening. You know, there's a lot of overlap. Um, so, and again, this might be something with its thermal tolerance that um, it's it has this annual life cycle, but maybe there isn't necessarily a seasonal thermal limit to, oh, it's too cold for it, that's why it's dying, or something like that. So you're seeing this overlap of it. So it's just constant. Doesn't sound good. <laughs> no. <laughs> yes, it's a little chaotic. Do you notice any difference when uh, El Nino comes through? Well, yeah, uh, when the El Nino came through, um, this is kind of like catapulted a lot of research on it because the kelp died off and then basically took over in the sense of it, it's replacing that space. It has more space to grow and, and attach and everything. So um, a lot of researchers, it was like, oh my God, what's happening, you know? And so um, again, it's been here for a while. So it's like 12 years now. But I think that warm water event wiping out the kelp was gave it that extra foothold it needed to really kind of cover. Um, so now it seems, it seems like there's a little bit of a balancing act going on now. We have certain sites that have a lot of kelp um, that's recovered, so that's great. And maybe it'll just take a while for it to kind of work itself out. Um, but uh, yeah, the El Nino, warm water, definitely just messing with everything around the, <laughs> around the island, <laughs> around the world. That's question. So how many different invasive uh, algaes are, are common in this area? I mean, this is one. Right, yes, that's a good question. Um, so we actually, in the genus Sargasm, 
There's actually four species you can find here on Catalina. Um, there's the native sargassum palmari. There's another one, um, Ardeatum. And then there's two invasive, actually. So there's Horner eye, and then there's another one called Muticum that was invasive back in the 1950s. Um, so that one is, you can, I mean, you can find all these around. Um, the most abundant ones are Palmeri and Horner eye. Um, Muticum, you know, there's been research done on it, but not as extensive. And I think in that time, there was another El Nino event in the 80s, but it kind of, just worked itself into the system and it's, you know, it's not as, it didn't seem as big of a pain. But at that point, it was already invaded and once it reaches, once an invasive reach, hard to get rid of it, especially in the marine environment. You have, because these can be, they can be detached, so it's important that people don't, you know, pull them up and just let it loose, um, you know, drag it around on the props of boats because it'll still float and reproduce. So it's already floated down to Baja it's invasive down in Mexico uh, because it's not dead. It's not like a plant that you up in it. Um, there's another invasive alga, um, uh, Daria, Daria something. And, uh, but that's not as, I haven't been <laughs> looking for it, but it's not as common. So there are a couple <laughs> out there and there could be more that we just like, you know, you don't really see. Um, algae is, crazy, and there's a lot of them, but there was one, um, Alerpa taxifolia, um, that was invasive in the harbor, and that one was, as soon as people spotted that, they did, they were really, really on top of, um, you know, eradicating it, pulling it out, everything, and they actually got rid of it. So that's like a success story, <laughs> uh, but that's because it was, from the moment it was found, it was like all hands on deck to get rid of it. Um, so it is possible to get rid of them at this point, this one. But there is a difference between this side of the island and the newer side. So um, I haven't been over there myself, but one of my lab mates has gone out there and she said it's not as abundant. You have difference of water flow and things like, you know, it's crazy. I like her. I've been diving this area and skin diving. I just went up to San Miguel last week and did all the islands. Mm -hmm. The kelp seems really healthy. Certainly yeah. up there mm -hmm. on the back sides, there's more kelp than I've seen in a long time. Right. right. Yeah. The kelp's been doing great. Um, yeah. Definitely up there. The water's colder. Um, it's been, it was pretty cold at the beginning of the summer last year. Um, it's started to kind of warm up a bit now. Um, but hopefully, you know, we, we are in our warmer months of the year out here. So hopefully it doesn't extend into the fall. And we don't, I mean, they projected a little bit of another El Nino. So, you know, got to see how things go. But the kelp is definitely, like I said, within just various spots that I'm like, oh, there's a kelp forest here. This is amazing. Like, this is what it's supposed to be like. Uh, but I'm sure if you've been diving around here, you know that the isthmus used to be a giant kelp forest. The cove used to be. so. There's still a lot that needs to recover, um, but it is doing better. It's definitely full water that came through in the last year and a half. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Thank you so much.